Please welcome and thank you for being here today. I'm Navneet Singh, your host for this webinar. I know that today's topic might bring up a number of questions from you. So you may type your questions in chat box and I want to let you know that we will address as many as we can in the time we have today. And I welcome and request uh, Professor Dr. Isha Preeti Tuli to start this session. Thank you and uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Today we shall be discussing uh, about vestibular migraine. And after today, I hope many of the doubts will be uh, resolved. So migraine and vestibular migraine are uh, quite closely interlinked. And so in order to understand about it, we need to know about migraine itself. What is migraine? It is headache along with other symptoms such as nausea, sensitivity to light, sound and even head movement. It is not a new entity and it was described by the ancient Greeks. The word hemigrania comes from Latin and the present word migraine is derived from the French language. The link between headache and vertigo is rather old. It was first described by Cappadocia. Uh, in by Ariatus of Cappadocia in 131 BC, the old Greek physician. In the 1960s, again, this was uh, described uh, in, in, in as benign paroxysmal vertigo of children and as well as migraine associated uh, vertigo and dizziness. Uh, but these terms such as migraineous vertigo, migraine associated dizziness, etc., have always been in vogue. But the first time the term vestibular migraine was introduced was by Thomas Brandt and Marion Dietrich in 1999. Finally, after so many years, it has found its place in the literature in 2012 when it was included in the appendix of the third edition of the International Classification of Headache Disorders. And recently, with growing uh, interest in this area and growing research, uh, these, uh, there has been an update. Uh, of uh, this in 2022. So the symptomatology of uh, migra vestibular migraine is very varied. The patient can have vestibular symptoms of rotational vertigo, illusion of movement, positional vertigo also. But in positional vertigo, unlike BPPV, the nystagmus is persistent, consistent, low to moderate, and does not disappear completely after doing a, a liberatory maneuver and they can be head motion intolerance. Now regarding illusion of movement, there is the feeling of disequilibrium or rocking and a feeling of out of body experience which is known as Alice in the Wonderland syndrome. And these sort of uh, symptoms can never be generated by the inner ear which will give a true vertigo but this illusion of movement will be generated by something which is more central. The uh, other is the duration. It can be from seconds to minutes to hours to even more than two to three days. Further, the migraine symptoms can always be present, may not be present. The patient can never give a history, might not even be aware that he ever had a headache. It might be a few days before or a few days after the attack. There will be associated symptoms such as photophobia, phonophobia and aura that can be visual or even to uh, sound. So is migraine of peripheral origin or uh, central origin? So. There, there are numerous uh, symptoms which suggest a peripheral origin, such as the vertigo can be rotatory, there may, might be a hearing loss, the patients can give a nystagmus, some changes of position. However, disequilibrium and rocking sensation, like I said, they point to a central etiology, labyrinthine says suppressants do not work in these patients. Sometimes we should might even have a normal hearing. And there are aura, auras and phobias, there is family history. Migraine headache, migraine headache may be present, uh, pointing to a central etiology, but it might be absent, uh, suggesting a peripheral etiology. There might be triggers, there might be emotional responses to both, uh, which suggest a central as well as a peripheral etiology. 
Nearly half of the world's population has described that they have had a migraine headache once in their lifetime. It is the seventh most common cause of disability and the incidence in India of migraine is 14%. And that of vestibular migraine is roughly 2.7% worldwide. Approximately 40% of migraine patients have had some accompanying vestibular syndrome. Like migraine, vestibular migraine is also more common in uh, middle-aged adults, more common in females compared to men. However, it is found in children as well as in adults such as in children it is uh, known as benign paroxysmal vertigo of childhood or congenital torticollis of childhood which is described as a migraine variant or a probably variant of vestibular. Surprisingly, this commonly found in boys as opposed to the vestibular migraine which we normally see more often in women. So, uh, the rule of 10 is uh, something uh, which uh, is a very popular rule in which it is said that 10% uh, of the population has migraine and 10% uh, of the migraine patients have vestibular migraine. So eventually, vestibular migraine is considered by some as a way the migraine progresses in an adult. So the patient had uh, uh, migraine attacks in the middle age, but as they grow older, they have less of migraine attacks and it gets converted into that of a vestibular migraine. Uh, it is considered episodic if it's less than 15 days a month and chronic if it occurs more than 15 days a month. And uh, uh, chronic uh, migraine or chronic vestibular migraine requires a prophylaxis treatment also. You will find in your OPD that patients uh, with vestibular migraine often come to you with chronic uh, symptoms necessitating a prophylaxis more often than what you find in acute uh, vestibular migraine. So, how does migraine occur? So, Harold Wolf, he is known as the father of modern headache research. In 1940s, he suggested that there is a vascular basis to the migraine symptoms. He identified different causes of uh, migraine, of aura migraine symptoms and headache migraine symptoms. And he said that aura stems from constriction and headaches are result of vasodilatation of blood vessels. So, vasodilators such as carbon dioxide were used to relieve an aura and patients avoided caffeine which could lead to trigger of aura because of its vasoconstrictive effects. In fact, Harold Wolf is supposed to have force fed his uh, residents with uh, a huge amounts of caffeine and just so that he could observe them uh, having uh, aura like symptoms. He himself uh, was a migrainer and probably that is why he was very much interested in this uh, field. However, uh, his theory though it was very popular till quite recently uh, rings uh, rise to two questions. First of all that if uh, it is a blood vessel then it doesn't attack what was the initial cause, why did the initial cause of this vasoconstriction of vasodilatation happen. And secondly, if it is again a vascular cause, then how are NSAIDs effective in aborting an acute attack? So, this theory nowadays is uh, not uh, accepted so much. And from vascular theory, we have gone to a neurovascular theory, largely due to the efforts of Carl Lashley and uh, Aristides Leo. Around the same time in 1940s itself, they were working on uh, uh, visual auras and epilepsy. Uh, Carl Lashley, in fact, uh, had used to suffer from scotomas due to uh, migraine, and he uh, proposed. And he proposed, along with Leo, proposed the uh, idea of a spreading uh, depression theory in the brain. And it has taken the scientific community many, many years uh, through their work and works of various other researchers to accept this neurovascular basis of uh, migraine. The current thinking now is that these episodes are mainly as a result of nerve or neurovascular uh, disruptions rather than solely dilatation or constriction of uh, blood vessels. So, nerve event being irritation of the trigeminal nerve caused by probably some 
blood vessels. Now we know these blood vessels are uh, located just below the brain and these are the blood vessels which are uh, stimulated where the, where the pain is felt. So one mechanism is through cortical spreading depression also known as spreading neuronal depression where the wave of a cortical excitation with the wave of cortical with a wave of cortical excitation followed by a wave of inhibition occurs this occurs particularly in genetic susceptible individual the wave marches over the cortical mantle at a very slow rate of 3 millimeters per minute and there is an accompanying elevated potassium and glutamate level now various neuroimaging techniques and genetic studies have supported this neurovascular theory where we can see that the cortical spreading depression is a slowly progressing uh, propagating depolarization of the neuronal and glial membranes which is evoked when the extracellular calcium potassium concentration rise above a genetically determined threshold so here are the waves of neuronal activity followed by inhibition and these correlate well with auras this is also uh, attributed to the inherent uh, propensity of the person to have leaky channels for some, for some reason, the migraineurs, their ion channels are more leaky than the ones of those non-migraineurs. So already, they are having a higher level of ions around the channels. And a very slight trigger will cause the release of the extra potassium or the glutamate, thereby triggering this cortical spreading depression. So the brain parenchyma is not sensitive. So we... So, where does the pain occur from and what is it that is hurting? The answer is through a cranial nerve 5 activation and the trigeminal vascular efferent activity that uh, activates the trigeminal cervical complication. So, the trigeminal nerve is activated when the pain which arises from the dura mater, dural vessels, extra and intracranial vessels, venous sinuses, cranial nerves, upper cervical roots, muscles and mesopharynx. All these are supplied by the C fibers of trigeminal nerve, mostly the first nerve that is by the first division that is where the pain is typically around the head and the ipsilateral temple. These vasoactive peptides after the stimulation are released by the trigeminal C fibers of the uh, of the trigeminal nerve which innervate the vasculature of the head and neck. So this causes a local uh, extravasation of uh, uh, inflammatory neuropeptides that is substance P, VIP and uh, calcitonin CGRP and therefore many migraine therapies will be targeting these individual neuropeptides in order to uh, prevent the, the attack on or order to abort the attack. Another factor which we must understand is so these they promote mast cell regeneration, protein extravasation and vasodilatation in the cerebral cortex, activation of the nerve receptors as well as in the arms and limbs causing various tingling sensation etc. Now, this dysmodulation of neurotransmitters can be genetic, they can be causing, uh, they can be environmental due to excessive tyramine ingestion, which can be converted to tyrosine, so receptors are here, which lead to this cascade. Important connection with vestibular migraine is that it has been found that glutamate is uh, released by vestibular afferents and if you remember, we have already told that cortical spreading depression somehow leads to increased glutamate activity. CGRP which is released here is also present in inner hair cells and there is also nitric oxide release which also modulates the function of vestibular nucleus. So here there is some link between the migraine and vestibular migraine. Further, there is ion channel disorder and mutations of the CACNA1A gene coding, which can also lead to these leaky channels. Additionally, there is anti activity and upregulation of 
uh, activity of the various brain stem nuclei these result in a drop of uh, pain thresholds so we can see that there is an activity which goes uh, from the brain stem to the cortex and back from the electrical cortex so thereby they keep on each stimulating each other there is inflammatory blood vessel abnormal uh, abnormal uh, activity of the brain cell so these nuclei are widely uh, these nuclei are widely present throughout the brain and may be also associated for responsible uh, for associated global symptoms of fatigue and uh, altered equilibrium and lastly it is believed that once these changes are persistent so there is they are stuck in a vicious cycle or a feedback loop and these various nuclei they become sensitive to stimulus and keep on perpetuating the attack of the migraine in a prone individual so again to uh, recap A genetic abnormality occurs in the neurovascular system and it makes it hyper excitable. These triggers can be either behavioral, environmental, dietary, chemical, hormonal and they set off this chain of neurological and biochemical events which leads to cortical spreading depression. This happens particularly in regions with reduced blood flow. The trigger factors <coughs> Excuse me, the triggering factors can influence neurons implicated in nociceptor act receptor activation, causing migraine pain in a susceptible individual. These neurons are typically unmyelinated C fibers of the trigeminal cervical complex. They innervate from the brain to the face and the neck, responsible for the characteristic pain depending on which fibers are stimulated. It is not only the nociceptor activation which is mandatory for the pain, but it is but it is not just the triggers which is mandatory for the pain, it is the nociceptor activation. Therefore, it is an important uh, point to understand that over and above the triggers if they are reduced, they can eventually lead to reduction of the various pain uh, sensation activity. Alongside the trigeminal nerve endings, there is a cascade of events which is uh, caused by releasing various neurotransmitters such as substance P, CGRP and vasoactive peptides. which will lead to substance P and release of various vasoactive peptides. These vasoactive peptides activate the intracranial vasculature below the meninges which are, have pain sensation and are responsible for vasodilatation, plasma uh, extravasation and increased pain which is typically found in migraine. The trigeminal nucleus activation and uh, uh, excitation events eventually leads to transmission of impulses into the thalamus into the sorry leave your pardon this leads to uh, this leads to uh, this leads to uh, activation of pain in the activation of the various thalamic centers and then finally to the uh, sensory cortex center just a few minutes So it leads to activation of this uh, thalamus and various other uh, and sensory cortex and it is in vestibular migraine 
there occurs a faulty filtration of input from the peripheral system through the thalamus. So even though the vestibular system is giving a right input, the thalamus interprets it faultily and that is relayed on forward and this is also one of the causes of causing of the vertigo symptoms in patients of vestibular migraine. Repeated such events lead to peripheral sensitization and brain becomes very sensitive even to stimulus it was not earlier sensitive to. So once the leaky channels they uh, trigger a spreading depression it leads to an aura. So, if the aura is over that of a visual cortex, then we will get a visual, it will cause scotoma. If it is over a sensory sensory strip, then it will cause tingling over the face or in the arms, perioral numbness. But if it occurs near the vestibular cochlear nuclei, the vestibular cochlear area, which you can see is very closely linked to the fifth cranial nerve in how closely they are linked. So, this will lead to symptoms of vertigo and dizziness or nausea etc. So there is uh, so an increased activity of metabolic activity in the trigeminal nuclei causes an increased activity in the surrounding nuclei because the overall brain entire brain has become hy hypersensitive and any sensory input triggers symptoms in an al already hypersensitive uh, patient therefore a small movement such as a small head movement can trigger a feeling of imbalance and disequilibrium also further the sensory innervation of the inner ear is also said to come from the unmyelinated c fibers of the trigeminal nerve there is a functional relationship between the trigeminal ganglia and the uh, and the uh, and the uh, and the utricle particularly but also between the stimulation of the trigeminal ganglia and uh, has shown that there is a secretion of um, a plasma extravasation in the cochlear and the basilar vascular bed. So perhaps vertigo, tinnitus and hearing defects are associated with migraine that are associated with migraine can arise from perturbations of these trigeminal sensory ganglia which project into the cochlea. Anatomically, various reciprocal connections have been found between the vestibular nuclei and the fifth cranial nerve nucleus. Nucleus neurons of the trigeminal uh, neurons of the trigeminal nerve uh, nucleus caudalis participates in various peripheral mechanisms of migraine, such as neurogenic inflammation that we have already discussed. Centrally, these same neuronal pools play a major role in rostral pain transmission as well as central sensitization where we can see that they are causing affecting the cortex, thalamus, hippocampus, brainstem, cerebellum, labyrinth. This reciprocal relationship between the trigeminal nerve and the inner ear can, can lead to uh, perhaps the uh, symptoms of vertigo in a patient of can lead to symptoms of vertigo in a patient of uh, vestibular migraine. Because of multiple potential interactions between trigeminal and vestibular systems, it is likely that vestibular migraine symptoms have a multifactorial pathogenesis. So, the entire brain is getting stimulated. So, why not the vestibular system also? Various possible mechanisms have been proposed. Uh, the potential involvement in interaction of the trigeminal vascular system with the brainstem, uh, nociceptive brainstem system, the thalamus, the hippocampus, uh, cortical network, vestibular network, all have been suggested to explain the underlying pathogenesis between the two. It is also believed that constant feedback from the trigeminal vascular system leads to upregulation of these nuclei, leads to an upregulation of these nuclei and these have projections throughout the reticular formation. So, um, so uh, suppose it is uh, stimulating the neocortex, so that is going to 
uh, affect our uh, memory perception our alertness suppose it affects the uh, medial lemnus so that affects our uh, sense of proprioception our uh, sensation in the locus ceruleus if it uh, affects then it affects our emotions the libratory nucleus then it affects our parasympathetic tone so therefore the patient can have intense nausea sweating vomiting etc so as these centers repeatedly get uh, stimulated even there is tolerance of a normal stimulus intolerance of a normal stimulus and they become hyper excitable so trigger in migraine is uh, a trigger in migraine uh, are dietary, environmental, and physiological. So the dietary are six C's, which we shall be discussing later. The weather, altitude, odors like computers, uh, light backlight from computers, using too much of cell phone, lack of sleep, thirst, hunger are being physiological. Various hormonal changes. Travel is considered a particularly uh, severe trigger because not only travel involves a lack of sleep because if the flight is early and uh, you have, there is a change in the weather and altitude and probably the diet but also various other stresses are associated such as the tickets, packing, going to the airport particularly if you are responsible for the entire family which is traveling with you. Important thing which I want to discuss is the role of magnesium. Magnesium is a cofactor in various enzymes and uh, there it is involved in various uh, many cellular functions. More than 300 coenzymes require uh, uh, more than 300 enzymes require the presence of magnesium for its catalytic action but mostly magnesium is responsible for energy utilization and synthesizing ATP. So therefore it is very important for keeping the brain in a hyper excitable or a normal excitable condition as you remember I had mentioned that there is a leakage constant leakage of potassium which is uh, due to a faulty channel and that leakage of potassium or faulty channel is using up the brain ATP. So magnesium is very important there particularly in the mitochondria. It is also responsible uh, so a systemic deficiency or a brain deficiency is found in patients of vestibular migraine as well as mine. So like I said magnesium uh, helps in making the ATP further. Magnesium is also responsible for a formation of phospholipids and insertions of them into the cellular membrane and therefore important for membrane stabilization with therefore preventing of the leaky ion channels uh, which can cause the migraine trigger. Now NM, uh, NMDA receptors are also associated with nociception and a lack of it is when the mag magnesium goes away then they get depolarized and they get activated. So magnesium has an important role here by stopping its the effect of NMDA on uh, various uh, neurons. There is also an important role of nitrous oxide because we know that nitrous oxide augments the role of magnesium of, uh, of NMDA receptor and magnesium counteracts this role. Magnesium is also important uh, to reduce the release of CGRP by various uh, at the presynaptic level which will again reduce the pain for these particular patients and is known to reduce the circulating CGRP levels. It is also uh, important, it is also found to have an effect on the platelets and it uh, reduces the level of serotonin and therefore levels of uh, the, therefore prevents the, uh, prevents the, uh, the, 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 the 5-HT1 uh, vasoconstriction and there is an inverse relationship between magnesium and the affinity of the cerebral vascular serotonin receptors. So magnesium here has a positive role in preventing both the aura as well as the pain. In fact, many people have reported that the pre-treatment of uh, patients with magnesium has found that it reduces the serotonin induced uh, vasoconstriction. So therefore magnesium is an important new finding 
which has been found as uh, to be helpful in the prophylaxis of migraine and therefore consequently vestibular migraine. To hammer the criteria of vestibular migraine once again, there is a quick recap. The criteria for vestibular migraine were definite and probable. They have been formulated both by the Baronius Society and the International Headache Society. And here we can see that there is a number of at least five episodes. There are two things which I want to make you aware of. Firstly, this number 5 is a very arbitrary number and secondly, uh, it could be because they thought that okay, there are 5 fingers in the hand, so let us have 5 episodes. And secondly, that this 5 episodes is a criteria for research. So, if you have a patient who fits with these various uh, criteria, uh, then but the episodes are not yet five. He has maybe had three episodes or four episodes and you have ruled out sinister causes of uh, episode, vestibular syndrome, then please consider starting the patient on a vestibular migraine therapy. So basically the absence of five episodes should not prevent you from instituting the treatment. So vestibular symptoms include spontaneous vertigo, positional vertigo, visual induced vertigo which you can commonly find patients say that when they are in a supermarket and an IL when there is a very busy environment then they face head motion induced vertigo and dizziness can be accompanied with nausea. It is moderate enough it can interfere with the daily activity however many times you will have patients say that even during in between the attacks they do not feel particularly normal and particularly healthy they do feel that there is some sort of a feeling of disequilibrium uh, continuous which again stresses the central etiology of vestibular migraine and it can be severe where the patient cannot continue the daily activity at all so in short the patient should have a five episodes of significant dizziness there is a history of migraine always and some factor or something whether it is nausea, vomiting or aura or phonophobia which we have mentioned, headache, any two and two with at least two, one or more migraine features in at least half the vestibular episodes which is either one-sided, pulsating, photophobia, phonophobia, visual aura, any two of these can we need, any one of these we need and in headache we need any two of these criteria. So, 50% episodes of vertigo have one or more features of migraine associated with them, that is a typical headache, photophobia or phonophobia and visual aura. And it does not fit into any other cause of vertigo. So, as you can see, the diagnosis is completely based on a very good history taking and as such, we do not have a good biomarker to identify the vestibular migraine. However, research is going on in this field. So visual aura uh, which is commonly found in migraine is that instead of scotoma which is top typically seen in migraine, in vestibular migraine patients often complain that the object appears a bit larger. The headache, the headache, the patient can have headache with the attack, before the attack, after the attack. They might not even be aware that it was a headache. They might even say that there was a dull pain in the neck. Or in the back and often times uh, we find in our OPD patients being referred to us from the orthopedic uh, physician for ruling out some neck pain and it turns out to be a case of vestibular migraine. So audiometry, audiometry can uh, the patient may show a mild or a moderate sensory neural hearing loss. It might be low frequency therefore even confusing you further or they might be normal hearing. The VNG will show here as we can see there is an upbeating, uh, there is an upbeating, we can see there is an upbeating nystagmus here we can see or it can be a downbeating nystagmus also both are reported and these are suppressed by fixation. It might again be absent. The caloric test in 20% patients, they will have a violent response to a caloric test, so much so that they will refuse to come to your clinic afterwards. 
so this should be a very significant clue that if your patient is having a severe response out of proportion response to a caloric test then maybe you are dealing with a vestibular migraine the v hit is often normal but sometimes here we can see that there is an upbeating nystagmus but this v hit is normal so there is the v hit vng mismatch can often be seen the subjective visual vertical it can be slightly deviated to one direction in these patients but most importantly, we have to know that there is a newer study which has shown the relation between the caloric test and the v hit. If the caloric test and v hit is found to be normal in the patients, these patients respond well to the treatment as compared to patients with poor response to caloric or an altered v hit test. So, are there any biomarkers? Makovic has found, has done a study and they have found that when they compared the ocular and CVAMP in patients, so the patient had most often a normal CVAMP in the setting of an abnormal OVAMP. And this could be due to, I had mentioned earlier, a relationship between the trigeminal vascular system and the utricle. This could be one of the causes. Another is the C fibers which supply to the vestibular nuclei also project into the thalamus and that might be also a reason for this abnormality. Another study was done by Z et al. in John Hopkins University and they found that patients so they found that patients had uh, uh, the patients of vestibular migraine in between the uh, ictal phase as well as they induced them with the caloric test, induced the attack with the caloric and they found that interictally or even post ictally or when they were having the active vestibular migraine, these patients had an increased uh, salivary uh, CGRP levels and this was very, very significant. And if you remember that we had discussed the release of salivary of CGRP earlier because we know that CGRP is released by inner hair cells. What about the various non-pharmacological management? This is highly, highly important and this control of these triggers is very important. Remember that I had mentioned the presence of trigger whether it is behavioral, environmental, dietary, etc. which they, which lead to uh, more, uh, which lead to uh, the uh, presence of an attack. They can also be hot, humid weather, increased noise level, there are various food triggers, fasting habit. In India, uh, particularly Hina application and I know that the festival season is going to come. So, we all will be aware the Hina application and the smells triggered by uh, that are also uh, responsible for uh, triggering of migraine. Sometimes stressful school situation, traveling and this is supposed, supposedly Lucas Ceruleus could be one of the uh, places where there is a faulty integration of the input and the vestibular. So, a good stress and anxiety management is highly important. Regular sleep, rehydration uh, which, uh, should be prevented and uh, the patients must have regular meals. So, regular sleep and regular meals and proper hydration. Uh, while dairy is an important cause, but here this is a diary. You, uh, it's a very painstaking process to maintain a migraine diary. But if the patient maintains a vestibular migraine diary as to what is triggering the symptoms, whether it is in these factors or in the food triggers, then the uh, therapy it will be very, very helpful. So, a strict dietary and trigger avoidance. So, here again, I would like to stress that recently we have started giving magnesium and riboflavin to the dose of 400 to uh, once a day to twice a day or riboflavin 200 milligram once a day to twice a day. The important thing here is in magnesium, you have to be very aware that the margin or uh, the safety threshold is very low and the patient can, if the patient presents to you with abdominal pain, uh, so you may have to stop the magnesium, but it has to be, it has been found extremely helpful uh, as an adjunct. 
regarding riboflavin it is a precursor for various coenzymes again used in redox reaction and we know that migraineurs use a lot of uh, uh, atp because of mitochondrial activation so it is a useful adjunct in terms of reducing both are useful adjuncts in terms of reducing the number of uh, days the episodes occur as well as the dependency of on medicine so this six c's is an amenic which i have taken such a professor peteria which includes cascade ahg um, msg and red wine for chocolate and citrus fruits so all things which are tasty and meant for celebration they should be best avoided in fact regarding ahg uh, uh, the smell of a freshly cooked bread can also be a trigger but then as soon as that fermented smell goes away and the bread is probably even uh, a few hours uh, from the oven and it is cooled down and the smell is no longer there the patient says that that bread does it there are other uh, factors which are nuts and peanuts are also supposed to trigger but we do not know what is the reason so now that we have made the diagnosis what we have to educate the patient and manage the expectations we have to screen their lifestyle their risk factors and existing co uh, morbid conditions why because based on this we will give the appropriate pharmacotherapy in fact it has been shown that 75% of the patient have reported relief just with one medicine and dietary control reduction of caffeine in itself has caused a reduction of vestibular migraine episodes in 16% of the patients so lifestyle and risk factor modification and treatment of coexisting condition is very important pharmacological therapy can be an acute therapy or a prophylactic therapy and again most importantly we am stressing on the reduction of uh, threshold so a normal patient will suppose have this will be the th threshold on which the patient will uh, have a uh, headache so the and this is the baseline but a migrainer threshold will be here so in order to bring this from here to here what do we do we uh, do a trigger reduction in the patient and that uh, is done by identifying the lifestyle uh, by making the lifestyle change For acute therapy, triptans are used. Uh, probably, it's a crossover benefit from uh, uh, acute from uh, migraine. They are weak vasoconstrictors, so they are best avoided in ischemic heart disease, uncontrolled diabetes, and in pregnancy. And sets are helpful. Vestibular suppressants are only helpful in twenty percent patients. Therefore, again, stressing on the central etiology of vestibular migraine. The earlier the treatment instituted, the better the chance of the patient to recover. The patient should be encouraged to take the treatment early and to avoid the triggers early. When do we give prophylaxis? When there are more than two attacks, there is no, however, there is no uniformly accepted timeline. Once the treatment is started, for six months it should be given and only then should a tapering be attempted and if it is considered successful if the attack's duration at least reduced by 50%. So most patients uh, in OPD like I have already said had a reduction, more than 75% reduction in attacks with diet and chemo profile. Significant interference with routine activity despite uh, taking acute treatment and when the attack frequency is more than a week, one per week is another reason to start the treatment. If the patient is having a severe med over medication use or if there is for some reason there is some contraindication or over adverse effect, then again prophylactic treatment is preferred. And when there are uncommon subtypes, then definitely we need to start the patients on a prophylactic treatment. So starting the uh, amitriptyline and nortriptyline, this is the most common uh, drug which is given as a first line drug. They are initially given in very high doses, 200 milligrams 
as an antidepressant however it was found that as a low dose they had a better role in uh, vestibular migraine and migraine so they started in extremely low dose in migraine and in this particular dose they do not cause uh, the uh, the troublesome side effects which is sedation your and uh, urinary retention or constipation so in if you are giving it to a so compliance with young patient is not good because of the side effect of sedation but if you are giving to a young patient then in that case it is good to keep a 12 hour uh, 12 hour uh, interval between taking the medical so suppose a patient gets up at 7 am in the morning then you give it at 7 pm in the night how do they act they act by stopping the blocking the uh, cortical spreading depression as well as they act on the thalamus and on the trigeminal vascular uterine system because they are also having uh, the one of the good things about them is they are a weak iron channel so they block almost all the ions whether it is calcium iron potassium uh, or sodium ion channels uh, so therefore they have a very good uh, effect regarding beta blocker it additionally blocks the cgrp and their action was uh, discovered uh, by accident when in uh, late 60s it was discovered that those when migraine patients who were treated for cardiovascular diseases with beta blockers, they developed less frequency of migraine. So, bupronolol is often preferred for otherwise metoprolol. For propronolol, we start with 40 milligram and gradually work up to 120 milligram per day. Regarding calcium channel blockers, they are preferred in India and uh, not so much in USA. And another is verapamil. Funarizine has a very uh, good role in preventing uh, attacks in case of pediatric population. So we know that migraine activity it starts in the cortex and by causing the cortical uh, spreading depression. Right. So we know that the increase in frequency of attack happens due to this cortical excitability. This happens due to sodium and calcium channels and flunorazine. It blocks the sodium channels, therefore it prevents the cortical spreading depression. It blocks the um, calcium channels and inhibits glutamate release and prevents neurogenic inflammation. And therefore it is very, very beneficial in cases of uh, migraine. The, the uh, important thing I wanted to tell you regarding beta blockers, uh, which uh, I missed, was the contraindication. They are contraindication in bronchial asthma and ischemic heart disease. So that is something we need to be careful about. Another thing about beta blockers was that sometimes they cause uh, postural hypotension if for any reason the patient is already taking a calcium channel blocker. So that one must be mindful about. So for these calcium channel blockers, like I said again, with beta blockers or even on their own, they cause postural hypotension. Uh, they might be exercise intolerance. So therefore, many times males do not prefer to take flunarizine. And uh, we flunarizine, we, uh, and the side effects include sometimes uh, dry mouth, constipation, etc. Amongst the newer medicine, anti Convulsant topiramate has recently uh, been uh, uh, anti-epileptic drug which has shown good results in various uh, randomized controlled uh, trials for vertigo in particular and other than that we can also give divalproate it again can be given in children. So topiramate it uh, acts on various uh, potassium and sodium again it prevents the various ion channel blockers acts as an ion channel blocker and uh, reduces the action potentials and therefore prevents cortical excitability by preventing cortical spreading depression additionally it also uh, act, uh, it also blocks the ampa receptor and this uh, inhibits the release of CGRP. It also inhibits the GABA receptors which again uh, are uh, helpful in prevention of pain. So the, uh, the medicine, the dose gets to be started at very low dose at 25 milligram and gradually increased and uh, so here we know that it is eventually stopping the 
आजकल थ्री मिलीग्राम तो डोज इज स्टार्टेड एट ट्वेंटी फाइव मिलीग्राम एंड ग्रेजुअली इंक्रीज बट देर इज अ वेरी बिग साइड इफेक्ट टू इट दैट इट कॉजेज द डिप्रेशन एंड ब्रेन फॉगिंग तो समटाइम्स अ पेशेंट कैन डिवेलप दिस ब्रेन फॉगिंग विद इन आवर्स ऑफ टेकिंग द मेडिसिन सो वन हैज टू बी माइंडफुल ऑफ दैट However, it is a very popular drug in the sense that at this doses it causes weight loss. So often times patients actually prefer to take this method. Valproate sodium again it uh, reduces the concentration of GABA in sodium channels and blocks them, and therefore it has its action. However, it should is not should not be given in pregnancy as it has teratogenic effect. various serotonin antagonist pizotifen it is popular in uk again and uh, it is a tyramine antagonist as well it is often used as a third line drug and it is often used in children and it uh, inhibits the peripheral actions of serotonin as well as uh, uh, histamine and uh, therefore it maintains the membrane permeability and prevents uh, extravasation and peripheral neurogenic inflammation and that's how it helps to reduce the uh, local actions of the uh, disease another new drug which is up and coming is a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor also known as uh, dex uh, des venlafaxine which is a active metabolite of venlafaxine it uh, since it is a antidepressant along with the dual action of 5-HT as well as uh, norepinephrine apreuptic inhibitor. So it is considered superior and it is a good option for patients who have concomitant depression or anxiety but we have to prevent it in, uh, not, not avoid it in patients with bleeding disorder or angle closure glaucoma and again in pregnancy. And a special uh, Uh, caveat is uh, special consideration is in it might lead to a serotonin uh, syndrome or toxicity particularly if the patient is on triptans so triptans are contraindicated while giving this desvenlafaxine or venlafaxine it also should be avoided in patients with aspirin as it increases the bleeding time so again we start at very low dose and gradually increase it and if the relief should be quite early and if it is not within 6 weeks then again gradually taper it down so uh, vestibular physiotherapy Vestibular physiotherapy it is found to be preventive, and it improves the uh, vestibular ocular reflex and the gaze stabilization. Unlike migraine, which is triggered by physical activity, vestibular migraine uh, can be the uh, attacks can be reduced, and the frequency of attacks also can be reduced. And exercise has been found very beneficial in patients of vestibular migraine. Two differentials. Differentials are uh, BPPV and Meniere's disease. So any cause of recurrent episodic vertigo, vestibular migraine, BPPV, and Meniere's disease must be thought about. The other differentials which we have to always exclude in patients because you remember the last line of the diagnostic criteria said any other criteria have been ruled out include. these of which i would like to uh, bring your particular attention to tia particularly if you have an elderly patient with uh, such a attack such as photophobia phonophobia some headache vertigo which is lasting for uh, up to even 72 hours so in those cases you must try and rule out a tia and a posterior circulation stroke syndrome so how do we do this we always check for a neurological deficiencies in these patients so a uh, a question you can so if we uh, bring out the criteria of vestibular migraine and meniere's disease we will find that the barony society has tried to uh, make a distinct between the two uh, in the terms of making the episode lasting 5 to 5 minutes to 72 hours versus 20 minutes to 12 hours even though there is quite a lot of overlap between the two another point of reference they have tried to differentiate is in the terms of low to medium 
frequency sensory neural hearing loss which is a must in many years but there is no requirement of a hearing loss in case of vestibular migraine. However, there are lots of patients in which who can get confused with one diagnosis a vestibular migraine can present with low frequency hearing loss and this 5 minutes to 72 hours and 20 minutes to 12 hours the time lap is quite overlapping in between. So, the question is when can I fit in the symptoms or is there any overlap between the symptoms of vestibular migraine because they have quite a few overlapping symptoms and there are common food triggers such as caffeine can trigger both migraine as well as vestibular migraine patients. So diagnosis is only based on history and we can do not as of now do not have with a good biomarker even though we have various um, upcoming biomarkers available. So the patients can have fluctuating hearing loss so uh, we find an uh, overlap between the two symptoms. The patient can have uh, uh, a patient of vestibular migraine uh, can have 25% uh, of the patients have a true spinning vertigo and this can even be up to 35% and fluctuating hearing loss can be seen in migraineurs. It can be seen uh, and it can be absent in Meniere's disease particularly if uh, it can the patient can come too late so there might already be a good amount of hearing loss present then oral pressure can be seen in uh, uh, up to 38 percent of uh, patients with vestibular migraine uh, oral pressure might mimic a mimic, uh, migraine headache in case of uh, patient of uh, Meniere's disease often after an acute attack they do complain of having a dull headache uh, which simulates a migraine headache and migraine headache often seems like a oral pressure if it is not severe enough. Photophobia, phonophobia can be seen in both the patients. So migraine is more common in patients with Meniere's disease and Meniere's disease is again more common in patients with migraine. In fact, uh, if we uh, read the original treatise of Prosper Meniere, he has suggested a possible link between Meniere's disease and migraine symptoms and supporting this we can see that there is a familial uh, familial clustering of patients of episodic vertigo, migraine and Meniere's disease. So there could be a common genetic link because there is a clustering in close relatives. Further both the disease have common triggers. So that is stress, sleep deprivation, diet change. So what is happening? Basically repeated attacks of, a, of migraine, uh, a one such proposed theory is repeated attacks of migraine is making the uh, inner, ear, uh, inner ear membrane which is very delicate uh, prone to damage. So we know that in migraine we have endolymphatic hydrops. This endolymphatic hydrops is due to some amount of endorphin damage. This is because there is some chronic hypoperfusion. This happens due to a vasospasm of spiral modular artery. And if you remember, we have discussed that spiral modular artery and basilar artery, cochlear artery, they are supplied by C type of fibers of the trigeminal nerve. So this could be one reason why the patients of migraine have Meniere's or Meniere's have migraine. Another thing is that these patients also have a leaky ion channel and another thing is we might be uh, and those lymphatic hydrops might be a type of a cochlear vestibular migraine. Therefore, an important point is that if a patient is coming to you with uh, refractory treatment to migraine, uh, west, uh, to Meniere's disease medication or a poor response to therapy, we must always give an anti-migraine drug to these patients before attempting a uh, intratympanic gentamicin or a destructive procedure. In fact, the clinical practice guidelines which has been recently updated in 2020 strongly recommends assessing for vestibular migraine in patients for Meniere's disease and treat them accordingly. So migraine is found to be three times more common in cases of patients with BPPD. Again, uh, uh, this was reported in 
2000. Again, the sorry. Recurrent BPPV was again more commonly found in patients with high vestibular myopathy. They should do at all did a study of uh, in which they studied migraine, vestibular migraine and BPPV in nearly 500 patients and they found that 22.4% of vestibular migraine patients had BPPV and 28.3% of BPPV patients had migraine. So some sort of a link is present between the two. Vestibular migraine patients have lower threshold to uh, uh, motions in certain planes and we know that vestibular migraine patients do present with some sort of a head position uh, nystagmus, uh, some sort of a head position vertigo. And where is the fault? The fault probably is in the integration of the canals and otoliths which occurs in the median of cerebellum or thalamus. So, the, the sim stimuli from the vestibule goes properly but there is a faulty integration higher up. So this brings us to the end of our today's lecture and uh, these are certain articles which I found very helpful in reading. I would further recommend you to read this expert panel summit. This is the most latest article and it has various famous personalities who have uh, who are responsible for identification of the pathophysiology of both migraine as well as vestibular migraine contributing to it. Um, so I would recommend this uh, article to everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much to Tresha. Trainees, uh, you may type your questions in the chat box if you have any. You can also raise, use raise and option so that I can give you the access to unmute and ask questions. I hope. So I think the concepts are clear. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Ishatali, for the presentation. And thank you very much, trainees, for joining. Thank you.